you know, I talk about quantitative and, and doing quantitative assessments of risk. And there's a lot of tools out there that can do that. Uh, there's a number that have, a, you know, CRQ is is uh, the buzzword anymore. Uh, but there, there's a number of those that are, are very uh, closed that, uh, again, it, it's uh, the methodology. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in if I use a tool, uh, if I uh, use something that pr- produces a score or a result that, when I present, I want to be able to explain it down to how I came about that conclusion, what framework it's based on. That's why uh, I believe following open frameworks in the CRQ world, what I use is something called Open Fair. Uh, you can uh, license it uh, as, as a practitioner. Uh, it's free as, as a company if you're a consultant uh, through uh, the uh, open group. They have a number of uh, open standards, so it's, it's an open standard there. And you, the use of FAIR for me uh, is, is, has been the game changer. In my previous role uh, at, at PayPal, uh, I didn't really have that. That's, we reported on it in, in high, medium, and lows. And I, you know, I was a, a, a very uh, pragmatic person, and I assessed third-party risk, and we were yellow according to uh, uh, the framework we had used. Everything else was red. Uh, so essentially the conversation was always the folks that had a risk theme that was in the red, they were arguing back and forth about, uh, getting funding and getting staff, uh, instead of being realistic. So that's what I use. That's, uh, uh, it can be challenging, uh, because there, there's, a, and I've seen, seen folks talk about it, that, that you need so much data to be able to do a fair assessment, which is very inaccurate. That's not a true statement. Uh, you could do, you can do very minimal fair assessments. What changes in the results is uh, the confidence level of the output. So having uh, a quantitative assessment with a lower confidence level is miles better than something plucked from the air and, and given a color on a chart. So, uh, yeah. Again, it, it's understanding it, learning how to do it, uh, and then gives you the ability then uh, when, when you know, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, when I was a CISO of the Commonwealth a long time ago, I did things differently. I, I used that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, you know, if you remember Larry Poneman, uh, his uh, cost of a data breach, right? Um, you know, I still remember in, in uh, uh, 2006, the cost of the data was $204 per record. So if my red team, if we found a, uh, a problem in the Commonwealth that we, we saved, 200,000 records from being exposed, 200,000 times 204. Oh, look what we've saved the Commonwealth. Uh, I need more money so we can continue. Yeah. Uh, worked really good. That's 20 years ago. It doesn't work today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to I wanna, I wanna keep, keep going in, in this. You know, uh, I see if you're talking about risk uh, a lot when you were talking about, you know, what is, what is the knowledge gas? gap what are you you know what is the the hurdles that you kind of see to kind of overcome that 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 the lack of awareness around risk to 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 bridge that and and i I guess you know yeah could you can you kind of go into what that looks like and how that how that affects the process yeah so it kind of touches on the points that i um talked about earlier um that there is not enough awareness that um of the human element in in uh, security breaches so it's not you know there you hear a lot in the news about um you know fancy hacking tools uh breaking into i don't know some chips or some cloud surface this and this or that but um at the end of the day these are highly skilled hackers and um they are you know relatively a few of them and um what we've seen is a lot of the the day-to-day hacking um, the majority in terms of quantity is simply phishing because it's a very, very cost effective way of entering an organization and then, you know, laterally moving in from there. Um, data access is super easy when you, you just have the access of a certain person to, to their accounts and whatnot. And, um, y- you know, this doesn't usually hit the news as hard as, as, you know, this or that breach or, uh, some vulnerability in, in a Java library or whatever. So, um, there is not enough awareness of this, like, you know, really, really kitchen table kind of hacking. Um, and um, let me just, I'll share a story of, of my own. Like when I got promoted to to my role, current role as head of product, um, 
so Cyberity, what it does, it uh, one of the things it does is we send phishing simulations. And when employees uh, click on the links in those phishing simulations, they get to a landing page with some training content. So this is, you know, what I do day to day. And when I, uh, the day I got promoted, or maybe that same week, um, I got an email uh, suddenly um, alerting me of some office supplies issue that I need to approve. And I like almost clicked the link and I'm like, wait a minute, this is a, this is one of our simulations. I got hit by our simulation. I almost clicked it just because I got distracted for a second. And like, I was worried about um, a new uh, issue. So this can really hit anyone. And I think um, one of the problems in the, in the knowledge gap is that board members are not aware that this could happen to them. This could happen really to anybody. Um, and it doesn't need to be like a, a higher up. It could be any employee with some access to to IP or to uh, accounts where they can, you know, spend money, that kind of stuff. So the, the human layer is very, very important, I think. And, and it doesn't get enough of a, a buzz in the news. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I tend to agree. Is is when we see a big breach, we can focus on the technical steps that they took, forgetting that the initial access was often a human clicking. You know, we can look at massive supply chain attacks, like you know, when Circle CI was breached. It all stemmed from an employee getting malware on their computer, likely through a phishing campaign. Um, but we tend to focus on the other steps that were taken uh, in the media. Um, Aaron, I I, I kind of see you nodding along to here. You know what what are some of the main hurdles that you see? And you're talking about communication and all that. You know, how how do you see you know this communication and and building on what Asif was saying about uh, perhaps uh, the board members not understanding you know the total scope of the risk and the human element of it. Yeah, I you know Asif, you've 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 hit the nail on the head. Like simple, like the Occam's razor approach. Um, that pragmatic approach is the best bang for your buck for anyone starting any any task right but like apply it to to this p particular domain you know like cross your t's and dot your dot, dot your i's right like um and i've talked a lot about this with folks because what happens is a lot of times you get different generations of builders and things like that building applications uh especially now that you see generative ai hit the table um that you know things that should have been common sense check boxes just get passed up but um but one thing I did want to hit home here, I know I got to, I want to keep this kind of focused, is that I think that sometimes organizations from maybe from inside the boardroom, but maybe just on the other end of that, uh, take on a too ambitious of a project where they can't get the flywheel starting, where the project takes too long, the deliverables are taking too long. And I think that that's once, once again, where if you start looking at the, the, the keep it simple, stupid methodology, right? And you take some of these simple, easy to implement technologies, programs, best practices, and get repeatable wins with that, I think that starts building up your credibility so that people do build the trust, but then that also get, allows you to have that communication uh, channel. And I think that that's essential to, to solving some of these, pro these problems. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, absolutely. Uh, Will, I want to I head over to you now because, I mean, you're, you're, in, uh, you're in the SOC, you're in the operation rooms, uh, dealing dealing with with this, you know, what what are some of the main hurdles that that you see? Because I guess you see the aftermath of, or the re the result of, you know, the communications not happening in 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 these operations as breaches are happening. Well, you know, what do you think are the main hurdles that need to be overcome? What I'll say about that is that, you know, thankfully in my position at Black Point Cyber, I get to interact with our partners twenty four seven um, on various yeah. amount of issues. The one sort of thing that I see as being a consistent trend is that oftentimes security is an afterthought. And so, you know, I always have conversations with customers about, well, only if I would have done this, if only I would have relayed this risk, uh, if only I would have procured this one tool. And I think the one area that we really need to see sort of uh, enhancements or improvements is what we just previously talked about was those communication barriers between, hey, the board is here to run the business, right? The security team, they're there to be the security team for the company, but the security team can't be an afterthought for the board. And so there needs to be a place for the security team to really sit with the board, right? And it wasn't until most recently that CISOs weren't really invited to meet with the board members, right? Uh, and now we're starting to see more and more where that's become the standard. The CISOs are in the meetings, they're sitting down with the board, but at the end of the day, it's about business operations, business continuity. And one area where I see a big sort of hurdle is there is this consistent 
issue with prioritization. And the prioritization has to be in line with what the business objectives are. If you're in a business that's in constant M&A, you're constantly acquiring other companies, well, you might need to have a process internally on your security team to validate the companies you're not you're purchasing are already compromised, right? You're introducing new risks. Those are just examples that I think over time, I've seen multiple iterations of where the security team and the board team aren't on the same page when it comes to the strategy. Mm. Yeah, strategy. I, li I like that. Brad, I want to take it over to you because, I mean, not only are you an executive in the company, but you also communicate with you know with the board, with other members mm -hmm. of of these teams and, and relay information. You know, what what do you think is the main over the hurdle to overcome when dealing with the knowledge gap? Yeah, and, and great question. And I, I think we've got a lot of really good information. I think, you know, using uh, FAIR as a framework is, is a great solution to give kind of consistently, uh, you know, information and show that, you know, how are we improving over time, you know, uh, from our risk profile. But sometimes, you know, as as Will said, you know, we're on the front lines. We see what happens every single day. And, and you know, companies will spend more and more for security and they still get compromised on a weekly or monthly basis. They get attacked every single day. And so, you know, the question often comes, you know, when something pops up in the news, like a couple of more recent big breaches, is how did that happen to them? Can it happen to us? And then what's the effect of that? So I think the, the CISOs need to be prepared to answer some of those questions. So it's more of a, you know, being informed and providing that information to the boards on a consistent basis, as well as the, you know, the programmatic, you know, risk framework profiles and all that kind of good stuff. But it's, you know, things along the lines of, you know, at attackers are working 24 by 7, even if your business is 9 to 5. Um, most of the breaches occur in, in off hours. So, you know, I may require 24 by 7 detection and response. Uh, I, I may need to do some other things to look at what is my uh, risk exposure and some level of offensive uh, protection. Um, you know, there's another thing that, that I think most companies don't realize is the concept of defense in depth. There might be, you know, two major solutions that you'll use for ERP or for finance, but there's hundreds, if not thousands of different security products that the security team is challenged to try and figure out how to piece these all together. And then there's a gap of cybersecurity professionals to understand that. So I think understanding the challenges of a CISO, you know, kind of the moving target, how the industry is moving are all things that boards you know, want to have some awareness to, you don't want to go into, you know, deep details and scary things, but I think there's, you know, a level of understanding that what are they reading in the news? How does that apply to us? And what are the challenges, you know, that a CISO faces on a regular basis? Uh, it's probably some of the knowledge that needs to be filled in into the gaps as well. <laughs> <laughs>